In this presentation, we will review rules 9.5 and 9.6, which focus on player actions and net play. Rule 9.5 begins by separating the player's actions into pass, attack, and block. The definitions of these terms can be found on page 36 and 37 of the rule book. Note that blocking or attacking the serve while the ball is entirely above the height of the net is illegal. The serve must be allowed to drop below the height of the net before it is sent back to the opponent's side. Further definitions of different kinds of passes can be found on page 36 of the rule book. Let's start talking about attacks. By rule, an attack is any action other than a block or a serve that directs the ball toward the opponent's playing space. Although we usually think of an attack as an aggressive one-arm swing at the ball, an attack can take many forms. An errant pass over the net or a set that drifts over the net also fit the definition of an attack. Any third team contact is automatically considered an attack since at that point, no more opportunities remain to direct the ball to the opposing team's court. An attack is considered to have been completed when one of two things occur. Either the attack completely crosses the vertical plane of the net or the attack is legally contacted by the opponent. This is an important component to the rule as an illegal attack cannot be whistled if one of those two things has not yet occurred. Provided the ball has not completely crossed the vertical plane of the net or the net extended, front row players are allowed to attack from any position, in front of or behind the attack line, and also above or below the height of the net. Back row players are more restricted in where and how they are allowed to attack the ball. While behind the attack line, back row players may attack the ball from any position. However, while on or in front of the attack line, or having left the floor from on or in front of the attack line, a back row player may not complete an attack if, at the moment of contact, the ball is entirely above the height of the net. In the next few slides, we'll take a look at a number of back row attack situations. In this picture, the player about to contact the ball is a back row player. Assuming this player makes legal contact with the ball, for instance, there's no multiple contact or a caught or thrown ball, the referee has a number of judgments to make. This graphic shows the decisions the referee must make in determining whether a back row attack was legal or illegal. First, the referee must determine whether the player or the player's last point of contact with the floor is on or in front of the attack line. If the player or their last point of contact with the floor is entirely behind the attack line, then the play is legal. If the referee needs to display information to a coach or partner that the back row attack was legal, then the referee may give an informational signal without a whistle indicating that the player was indeed entirely behind the line. If the player or their last point of contact with the floor is on or in front of the attack line, then the referee must make the next judgment. Is the ball entirely above the height of the net at the moment of contact? If the ball is not entirely above the height of the net at the moment of contact, then the play is legal. Again, the referee can display information to a coach or partner that an attack by a back row player on or in front of the line is legal. If the ball is entirely above the height of the net at the moment of contact, then there is an illegal back row attack in the making. However, the back row attack does not occur until the attack is completed, meaning it must completely cross the net or be legally contacted by the opponent. If the attack is never completed, then the play is still legal. For instance, let's assume for a moment that the player in the picture is about to make the team's second contact. If she took off from or in front of the line and the ball is entirely above the height of the net when she makes the contact, then the referee must still wait for the attack to be completed before whistling a fault. If the player hits the ball into the body of the net and it stays on her own side, then the attack has not been completed and the team on the right still has one more contact remaining. Either player in the front row could feasibly make the third contact and send the ball over the net legally. If, however, the player hits the ball over the net, and it either completely crosses over into the other team's playing space 
Or if player number seven on the left legally blocks the ball, then at that point, the, ta the attack has been completed and the play has become illegal. Remember, a completed block is one where the blocker touches the ball. It does not matter where the ball goes after the blocker touches it. In this clip, back row player number 25 attacks the ball. The referee must make the following decisions. Was the player's last point of contact on or in front of the attack line? Was the contact of the ball while the ball was entirely above the height of the net? Was the attack completed? In this replay, you can see the player's foot is clearly on the line when she takes off. Although the camera angle makes it hard to tell whether the ball is entirely above the height of the net, in the referee's judgment, it was. The back row attack is called once the attack is complete by the ball entirely crossing the vertical plane of the net. A common occurrence is for a back row setter to become a back row attacker when working with a pass that puts the ball close to or in the vertical plane of the net. In this picture, assuming number three is a back row setter, she has now become a back row attacker as the ball is completely above the height of the net and her opponents have made contact with the ball. Sometimes the back row attack is more deliberate on the part of the setter as illustrated in the next video. In this video, you'll see the back row setter on the right make the second team contact, but instead of setting a teammate, she sends the ball to the other team's side. In the referee's judgment, the contact on the ball happened when the ball was entirely above the height of the net, and the player is obviously in front of the attack line. So this is an illegal back row attack. In this video, you'll see the back row setter on the left make the second team contact. His setting action turns into attack when he sends the ball across the net. He is a back row player in front of the attack line, but once you see the view from the back line, it is clear that the ball was not entirely above the height of the net when he makes contact. So the back row attack is legal. In a situation like this, had the coach of the red team questioned the legality of the attack, the referee could have given an informational signal to show that the ball was not entirely above the height of the net. Now let's talk about blocking. To be a blocker, a player must be near the net and be reaching above the height of the net when contacting the ball. While a back row attack has to do with the position of the ball at the time of contact, determining a back row block concentrates on the position of the player at the time of contacting the ball. We've already mentioned that blocking a serve is not allowed. However, any front row player may block a ball other than the serve once it has entered the vertical plane of the net. In addition, there are a few instances listed here when a legal front row blocker may play a ball that is entirely on the opponent's side of the net. Back row player may not complete a block or participate in a completed collective block. When the ball is touched by any of the players in a collective block, all the players are considered to have completed that block. Usually, Back row players don't typically find themselves at the net in a blocking position. However, an exception here are back row setters. Since the setter is frequently at the net making the second team contact and sometimes must reach higher than the top of the net to make that contact, the setter can easily turn into a blocker under the right circumstances. As in this picture, a tight pass or an overpass that a back row setter tries to save and become a blocked ball if the setter is reaching above the height of the net and a player from the other side attacks or blocks it back into him. 
This is the most common instance of a back row block. As an aside, if the setter in this picture contacted the ball first and then the ball touched the blocker in green, the setter would then have completed an illegal back row attack. In this clip, the setter, number 21 on the left side of the net, is coming from the back row to make the second team contact. The ball is overpassed to the other team. The setter, in trying to save the ball, reaches higher than the top of the net. The middle blocker on the right pushes the ball back into the setter's hands. The setter, who is close to the net, deflects the ball coming from the opponent while reaching higher than the top of the net at the moment of contact. Even if it wasn't the setter's intention to block, she now meets the definition of a blocker. Since she is a back row player who completed a block, this is an illegal back row block. Not every illegal block is so obvious. Watch this video to see if you can spot it. Here it is one more time. The player who hit out of the back row landed very near the net. And when the next play was made close to the net, he jumped to block the ball, after which he quickly backpedaled to return to his back row position. Both officials should have been aware of every player's position so that they could catch that illegal contact. Rule 956 details actions that are not allowed to be performed by the libero. As a mostly defensive player, the libero is limited in the way he or she can participate in the team's offense. One of the restrictions on the libero is that they cannot attack the ball if contact is made while the ball is entirely above the height of the net. This sounds similar to the restriction on back row players. However, while regular back row players may complete an attack from above the height of the net, if positioned behind the attack line, the libero is restricted from completing an attack above the height of the net anywhere on the court. Secondly, the libero may not set the ball using overhead finger action in front of the attack line and have the next contact be a completed attack from above the height of the net. Note that this is a two-part rule. There is nothing inherently illegal about the libero setting the ball in front of the attack line. The libero's action only becomes illegal if the next contact is a completed attack from above the height of the net. When this occurs, the signal is an illegal attack, signal eight. If necessary for clarification, the referee may point with an open hand at the libero. In addition, a libero may not even attempt to block. Remember from our previous slides that a block is not completed unless the ball is touched by a blocker. However, where the libero is concerned, just attempting to block, even if no contact is made with the ball, is an illegal action. In this video, the libero jumps and attacks the ball from behind the attack line. The referee must determine whether the ball was entirely above the height of the net when the libero made contact with the ball. It is important to remember the language of the rules. Specifically, there is no language in the rules about whether a player jumps or stays on the ground. We must only determine the height of the ball at the moment of contact. In this video, the liberos on both sides of the court set the ball using overhead finger action. On the left, the libero in red is clearly behind the line when the action is performed, so the next contact can be an attack from above the height of the net. On the right, the libero last makes contact with the floor behind the attack line. He jumps, contacts the ball with overhead finger action, and then lands in front of the attack line. The subsequent attack from above the height of the net is also legal, 
because at the last point the Libro touched on the floor, he was behind the attack line. Had the Libro touched a point on or in front of the attack line before contacting the ball, the result would have been an illegal attack once the attack from above the height of the net was completed. Rule 9-6 clarifies net play by stating that the ball has to pass between the antennas without contacting either one in order to remain in play. A ball hit into the net may be recovered provided the team still has allowable hits remaining. Only when executing a legal block, the qualifications of which we've already discussed in previous slides, may contact be made with a ball that is still entirely on the opponent's side of the net. A net fault occurs when the ball is in play and a player contacts any part of the net, including net cables or net antennas. Net faults can also be called when, in the referee's judgment, a player contacts an opponent and interferes with the opponent's legitimate effort to play the ball or gains an advantage by contacting any cables, standards, or the referee's platform. Rule 957 supplies clear language to determine whether a centerline violation has occurred. Regardless of whether a player is near the play on the ball or not, if an entire foot or hand is placed across the center line, a violation has occurred. If a portion of the foot or hand rests on or above the center line, then no violation has occurred and play may continue. A player may fully cross over the center line extended outside of the court provided he or she does not interfere with the opposing team's play. However, once the ball crosses the center line extended outside the court, it is considered out and play should be stopped.